privilege tonight to have uh, Pastor Chris Serva come and share with us. We'll invite him up. Verses 9 through 1. Here's what it says. 
This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for sins. And here's the real kicker. And this is the thing that we struggle with most, it seems. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. There is no they in the kingdom. This is right at the center of what it means to follow after Jesus Christ in ways consistent, not with your religious upbringing or mine, but in ways consistent with what Jesus says about himself. And, and I want you to be honest. Look, I, look I, I, if you, look, you don't know me, uh, I've got like more degrees than a thermostat, I would say. I am like the quintessential uh, well-trained Jew, like, the, like uh, uh, I'm not Jewish, I mean that metaphorically, like the Apostle Paul. And, uh, you know, uh, I've got all the degrees, uh, all the whatever, and uh, man, if you're not cautious, your religion will keep you from the kingdom. And if you're not cautious as a follower of Christ, your religion will keep unbelievers from the kingdom. So let's just talk about God's love. 1 John 4, 9, the beginning of that verse. This is the very way that we know that God is love. Okay, If somebody asks you, well, how do you know God is love? How do you know that? What makes you think that? The world is full of so much evil and bad. How can we be sure that God loves us? Well, this is the way. The way that we know God loved us is that he revealed his love to us because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. God's love always looks like Jesus dying on the cross. Now, I asked at the beginning, right, like a, like a bad country singer, you know, being a sinner's up in his house. And uh, listen, every, everybody here kind of seemed to affirm that they're a sinner. I don't know, man. I, like, it, it, I, I feel a lot like the Apostle Paul, who says this is a saying worth repeating. I am the chief of sinners. I'm so good at it. Like a pro, like if you got paid for it, man, I'd be rich. Even after all these years following Jesus, if I'm honest, I'm not better than anybody else at this following Jesus thing. The only difference between me and somebody else who who, who uh, maybe just, just hasn't met Christ is that I, I, I have a deeper burden and a heavier sense of just how much I'm probably doing it wrong. We've got to be careful about our paradigms about the way in which we frame what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay, Again, this is a message I think that speaks to you. If you're a Christian, I hope there's some measure of consideration and contemplation and maybe even a little conviction that comes from these inherently biblical ideas. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, well, I, I hope this will maybe elucidate, maybe, maybe shine a light on uh, what the kingdom is as juxtaposed to all of the counterfeit versions of the kingdom that we find in the world, and frankly, that we find in some of the churches I've pastored, some of the churches you attend. I mean, why? Because of our utter imperfection, and then us always wanting to drag our old identities into the Christian life. The world conquers with a sword. I was a Marine for eight years, and I spent two years in the Army. My fight or flight response has always been all fight, right? And, 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 then, and then the Marine Corps took it and like made it absurdly so. The world conquers with the sword, with power, with domination, political influence, wealth, prestige. Jesus conquers with the cross. Listen, I'm going to suggest to you tonight that if you are an unbeliever and you're staying away from the kingdom, because when you look at the kingdom, what do you see? Maybe you see just like a counterfeit version of the world. You're like, man, all those people seem to care about is letting me know what they hate. And then trying as hard as they can to get political influence to enforce what they hate. That's not how Jesus does it, though. 
Jesus, hanging on the cross, the Lord of Lords says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He looks over to his left. The, the one repentant sinner says to him, you'll be with me today in paradise. He gained victory by way of sacrifice, and that is what God is calling us to do. That's the bullseye of the kingdom. Like I said, uh, for some of you who might have been present, I don't know, the days just blur together these days, a few nights ago at Southside for the Serve the City business, we're supposed to be known by the scars, not by our power, not by our political influence. And, he, and look, I, some of you can't even hear me say that. Frankly, some of you can't even hear me say that. In your mind, some of you just said, I, I knew he was a liberal. But that's not all I'm saying. What I'm saying to you is the kingdom in the domain in which Christ is king, you and I are not defined by our political identities. We're only defined as citizens of the domain in which Christ is king, the kingdom of God. And our primary allegiance is to Christ the King, who is the Lamb who sacrificed Himself for the sins of the world. What are we doing if internally our heart's affections are more closely aligned to this political party or that, or this way of being or that? Remember, when I moved to Suffolk, I pastored two churches in Suffolk. Cypress Chapel Christian Church, and then we lived a year in Haiti, and now I pastor Liberty Spring Christian Church. When we first showed up to, to uh, Cypress Chapel, there's an old old guy. I love him. I won't tell you his name because many of you would know him. And uh, man, he said to me, uh, "So where are you where are you from, boy?" He said it just like that. Where are you from, boy? And I thought to myself, "You don't know you're messing with me. You're probably picking a fight with me." <laughs> don't let the don't let the pastor close for <laughs> And. Uh, and he, he, I said, well, you know, I've lived all over the country, uh, but I'm from California. And he says to me, see, he, he, says, oh, similar. he, he made a similar grunt. <laughs> and, then, and, then he said, and then he said, he said exactly this. He said, he said exactly this. It's etched in my brain. Well, at least you ain't a Yankee. <laughs> Flies and swamps. That's what they did right <laughs> And so, so immediately I started to think, oh my goodness, so, so that, that south north paradigm that didn't end in the 1800s, that's still going on. Oh yeah. <laughs> Listen, we, we've got to be cautious. I would suggest to you, if this passage of scripture has any practical relevance in our lives, we've got to be cautious about defining ourselves in terms of like. You know, the, the, these false tribes, these tri tribal dichotomy things, you know, I'm this party or that party, I'm, I'm Southern or I'm Northern, I'm an American or I'm not, or I'm some other, you know, nationality. No, if, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation, and we are a part of one kingdom, one body. There's only two kinds of people in this world. There's people who, who are outside the kingdom because they have yet to receive the grace of God in Christ. And there's other really bad sinners just like them who just happen to have received the grace of God in Christ. Amen. There's kingdom citizens and then others. I want to suggest to you today that that weird tribalism thing that we can fall into, it's a thing of the world. It's not supposed to be a reality of the kingdom. And if we're not careful, that tribalism will have us, maybe even unaware, living the Christian life in such a way so as to define it in terms of us and them. But there's no they in the kingdom. There's only the people for whom Jesus died, and that's the whole world. And, and that death on the cross, as best I can tell, is a real offer of salvation to the entire human race. Be careful getting caught up in your certain theological camps as well. I want to suggest to you that that's a real danger. This last week, it's just, it's just really hit me. Some friends of mine on Facebook, some friends of mine uh, from no less than three local churches. This week, it seemed like everybody I ran into wanted to pick my brain about Calvinism and Arminianism. And I'm like, man, I lost like three years of my life 
trying to understand the difference between those two, and at the end of the day, I became something altogether different. First, can really confuse, and then secondly, I, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to follow Jesus and interact with this passage and that passage, and, and, and this passage in Romans 8 or Ephesians uh, 2 or Galatians 1, these passages that seem like Calvinistic, well, they tell me that God's got this all figured out. And then these other passages that seem like Arminian or Wesleyan, if those two phrases mean nothing to you, good for you. Mackerel. <laughs> then those, those passages that seem like Wesleyan or Arminian, those warning passages, be careful, be careful. Those trees that don't bear any fruit, he's going to cut them down and burn them in the fire. Well, man, that sounds awfully like you could lose salvation. Well, I, I don't know that I can lose salvation, but I know that if, if that warning comes to me and I'm in Christ, even if I'm predestined to be so, even if I'm a, a, a super lapsarian, if you want to get really technical about it, and, and uh, then I better take my discipleship seriously. Because at the end of the day, someone who emphasizes greatly the sovereign hand of God, or someone who emphasizes something else that's completely equally valid and true from Scripture, that I better be careful how I'm living as a Christian. At the end of the day, that Calvinist and that Wesleyan ought to come to this, a very similar conclusion. Day in, day out, I'm just a daily disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen, I want to I want to warn you. And I know for sure there's a lot of us floating around this city. I'm not even playing around. Between three churches this week, it seemed like everybody wanted to talk about it. I'm like, where were you 10 years ago when I was like losing sleep over this issue? I thought I, you know, I could have, could have saved you a lot of time. I burned it up myself. Be careful of tribalism. Because in the kingdom there is no they. There are just those covered by the grace of God and those waiting to hear that message. I, I wonder if, if you currently burn up 20 hours a week trying to understand Calvinism or trying to convince somebody else that it had, you, have, you don't affirm the doctrines of grace. Well, okay, maybe spend like 10 hours a week just trying to figure out how to reach the lost with the Amen. same gospel Amen. and let it go. Amen. If I could sing, I'd break into that song right now. <laughs> let it go. <laughs> daily disciple following after Christ is about being a citizen of that domain in which Christ is king. What, I mean, however you got there, rather than arguing about how you got there, praise God that you're there and do something with it. Amen. Listen, the, the world is full of evil and bad because we, not they, commit all kinds of evil. We reject God. We we, we're saved by grace, and then we argue about the nature of that salvation. We're saved by grace, and then rather than being obedient to the call to lead others to Christ, we, we all of a sudden start to make our little camps, you know. I'm Baptist, so I'm super holy. <laughs> oh, he's a Christian church pastor. That means he must be liberal. <laughs> Don't assume too much. My doctorate's from Temple Baptist Seminary. You know, I'm getting more conservative than that. Listen to this passage of Scripture and then a couple more thoughts and then we'll uh, close it out. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. If this isn't a familiar passage to you, if you're anything like me, you need to make it such. Do not judge or you too will be judged, Jesus says. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. We're all the time talking about love the sinner and hate the sin. Why don't we love that sinner and hate our own sin? Mm -hmm. right. Why don't we just, just flip that paradigm a little bit? Why don't we just, just love the sinner? And then thank God that he loved us. Listen, I, I want to suggest to you real quick that uh, Jesus didn't die primarily to set you free from hell. That's a consequence of having been set free from sin. And the primary, the, the earliest sin in the Bible is what? The disobedience. Right? We're blaming all our wives. I'm still doing that. <laughs> you know, I'm blaming our wives who brought them the apple or whatever it was. The, whatever it was, exactly. And uh, 
the first sin was disobedience, but that disobedience was predicated on the sin of judgment. There's an inherent connection to the judgmentalism, the Pharisaism of many churches today and that first sin, because that first sin was saying to God, I'll make my own judgments. I'll decide for me. And right now, to the extent that any of us are standing in judgment of the sins of other people, rather than loving one another and loving the world earnestly, sincerely, honestly, getting free from judgmentalism, to that extent we're still committing that same first sin. No, you don't know better, God. I'll judge myself. Consider the way that we work. The vast majority of us are far more concerned with the money we make from our labor than finding rest and joy and satisfaction even in the laboring. Because we've been conditioned in our culture primarily to concern ourselves with the consequences rather than the actions. You know, people work and work and work. Why? So that someday they can sit down and stop working. Rather than finding joy in the labor. It, we, we have this kind of similar mindset, I would argue, when it comes to salvation. We're always like carrying around a get out of hell free card. I prayed the prayer. I, I walked down there. I prayed the prayer. The preacher who led me in that sinner's prayer, well, he's a Baptist, so it must have been a good one. And uh, so I got my card. I got my get out of hell free card, so I'm straight. And then all of a sudden, we have the, the consequence of the thing rather than living in the thing when the thing is that if we're set free from sin, that means that we should be a daily Disciple, not so concerned with our destination, but with what God is doing now in our lives in the context of kingdom life. God didn't, listen, God didn't send His Son to set you free from hell, I would suggest, but rather to set you free from sin so that we can start living a kingdom life now. Among the consequences of that freedom is freedom from eternal separation and judgment and wrath. Listen, Jesus didn't die on the cross just to set you free from hell. Don't just say, I got my card. He died on the cross to, to pull us into a vibrant community consistent with the words of 1 John chapter 4. Love one another. Brethren, if Jesus so loved us, then we ought to love one another. Amen. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Don't fall back into the yoke of that judgmentalism, that same sin that Adam and Eve committed. I'll make my own judgments. God says, clearly in His Word, that there's only one class of humanity, and that's a bunch of sinners. And then we become saved, and then we start to flip that on its head, and we say, well, I'm saved, I'm good, I'm better than them. Be honest with yourself. Nowhere in the Bible, though, can we find some kind of hierarchy of sin. Our judgment, our idolatry, listen, my straight-up gluttony. I walk by this young man over here, this man with the Marine Corps haircut. What's your name, sir? Dawson. Dawson. He looks like a young Marine. I'm going to go... Introduce him to a recruiter later. <laughs> He's already got the look. And uh, I, you know, I do this with my hair because I'm like obsessed after all that time in the Marine Corps. It starts to feel dirty. But that's a whole other thing. I don't have a psychologist. I need one. And, uh, and uh, well, that really threw me off. Gluttony. Huh? Gluttony. Thank you, sir. Gluttony. Listen, what has him looking like the Marine like 20 years ago, is that the man hasn't fallen into gluttony, and I suggest you don't. But my gluttony is mentioned more times in the Bible than many of our pet and favorite sins. Idolatry, I wrote it down here somewhere, who knows where, idolatry is mentioned something like at least 54 times directly in the New Testament, and in the Old, and alluded to maybe up to 200 times, maybe more, as best I could find. Idolatry. That is, putting anything in front of your worship of God. And I've been guilty of that. Any, I mean, am I the only like, real sinner in here? I've been guilty of that. Putting, putting uh, sexual pleasure before God. Putting wealth before God. Security and stability. 
focus more on my retirement and my security than putting my life in God's hands? That's all idolatry. You know, I, I, we, we, we're all the time these days, and uh, when I say this, don't, don't, again, don't tune me out. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, gay marriage is a good thing. But you know that homosexuality is mentioned six times as best I can discern and discover in the Bible. Three in the old, three in the new. God ain't into it, okay? I'm not saying it's a good thing. But I'm saying that if idolatry is mentioned maybe 200 or more times, according to one scholar, 400 times at least it's alluded to, maybe the church ought to go on a campaign to lock the doors to all the idolaters. But then none of us would get to come in. The Bible mentions many more times gluttony. But it's like you can't even get a job as a pastor if you're not overweight. <laughs> you know? And my, my point here is just to say that there is no hierarchy of sins. And just because someone else's sin makes you more uncomfortable than someone else's sin, that doesn't mean that we ought to push out anybody because of their sin, but rather be loving the masses. You know, I sat down with my good friend, Mr. Jason Weeks, and uh, he said, you know, I'm glad to see you here. And I said, you know, Jesus dined with sinners too. And uh, <laughs> it was like, I took you all a second longer. <laughs> how good of friends we are. <laughs> why, why, why do we categorize sin? Why do we do it? Because our religious idolatry tells us that it's okay. But inside of this domain where Christ is king, there is no hierarchy of sin. And regardless of who you are tonight, if you, if you don't know Christ and his salvation, the thing that's keeping you out is you're like, man, it just seems like a bunch of hypocrisy, a bunch of, a bunch of self-righteousness. Yeah, some of that is going on. And be cautious not to be so self-righteous yourself as to say, well, I'm not a hypocrite like them. Every once in a while when I get motivated and I go to the gym, <laughs> I'm like, this is clearly a place for gluttonous hypocrites. Like, and like people like me, they're like, well, it's January 10th, I'm getting in shape. <laughs> Marina ate it and he's down in there somewhere. <laughs> Listen, let, let, let's be careful because we are, can get distracted. And I'm going to this thought. We can get distracted and be distracted with so many things. So much tribalism these days is just like heavy on my mind. So much false dichotomy. It's like Satan is doing the most, the most ingenious maneuver in the churches today to divide and conquer. You got to be Calvinist or Arminian. Yeah, truth be told, listen, I, I've studied these things at a very high level. Most of y'all are Calvinists. You ain't that good Calvinists. You're really not. You, you don't, you, many of us who, who lean that way, John Calvin wouldn't dig your Calvinism. Martin Luther wouldn't, wouldn't dig your Reformed theology. Not a one person in here, probably, if you go to a Baptist church wants to baptize infants. They did. Arminius? Man, most of us are living this eclectic Christian life because you had some goofball pastor like me tell you one thing, you had some other guy tell you something else, and then you got on TV and listened, and listened to Joel Osteen, and you're like all confused. You don't know what to think. <laughs> Why not just be a disciple? And just deal with the Bible on its own terms. If you're reading this passage, apply it the way it, the, it, it says and the Holy Spirit leads you. If you're reading this passage, emphasize that. And then your system of theology ought to be consistent with nothing but Matthew 28. To live a life reflecting the mercy and love and grace of God and sharing that with one another and with the world. And if you just do that, man, all that other stuff starts to seem like, eh, yeah, that's good. You know, you should probably be familiar with it when you go to seminary to lose your faith. You know, I mean, that's good. You know, it's good. You should know about that stuff. But listen, God's love isn't reserved for us, and His wrath isn't reserved for them. And we can be so foolish so that even within the same churches, we start to divide over very 
very specific theologies. If you don't affirm the doctrines of grace, you don't really know God. Oh, really? Well, if you think you can't lose your salvation, you better be careful because I'm watching you be a hypocrite and a sinner. Even in, in the churches, we divide ourselves into camps and tribes. And we start to make an us and them. And the most tragic of all, we look around the world and we're like, those are the real sinners. There's a bunch of men here tonight. Statistically speaking, a bunch of us struggle with sexual addiction. And a bunch of these young men, if we don't break the generational curse, so will they. And they'll do the same thing that some of us are doing. Hide it behind our religious idolatry. It's all good. I'm in church on Sunday. Pay my tithe. I read the right book. I read How to Be a Reformed Dude. There is no us in them. There's just, there, there's just us. And we're a bunch of broken sinners. And I want to suggest to you tonight that the only way out of that idolatry is to start to step out of that idolatry. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. If he loved us so much, let's love one another. And then let's just authentically, honestly, share that love with the world. Hey, man, I'm just a... Let's listen. You ain't never met somebody with a doctoral degree who's as messed up as me. I promise you that. Just ask my... One of my sons is here. I got all those religious hoops jumped through like a poodle, like a flaming hoop. Poodle jumper. And I'm still just the same guy that Jesus found broken. And a little by little, that grace is changing me. That's it. That's the message of the cross. He loved us. Now we ought to reflect that love to one another, to Him in worship, and to others by way of sharing that grace and mercy. Like a pebble at the bottom of Niagara Falls overwhelmed by grace, covered by grace, being shaped and refined and smoothed by grace. And then God says, just reflect it back up to me by way of worship to one another in love and to the world by sharing my story. I hope something of that God will use for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you guys tonight. Lord, I thank you for this group of men willing to come together to set aside some time for fellowship. And if it's just real meat that brought us here, so be it. And I pray tonight, God, just around the power of your word and your potential usage of this broken, imperfect vessel, that we might feast our souls on meat for men. That you would transform and change some men in this place to be the kind of men who know that we conquer in love as kingdom citizens, that our greatest strength is in laying down our lives for our families, for one another, and for the world around us, for our churches. Mighty and everlasting God, won't you be truly mighty in us by instilling in us a deep and lasting and unforgettable conviction to be conquerors with the cross, not with the various swords of our own manufacture, with which we usually harm others and ourselves, ultimately. Gracious and everlasting God, if there's anybody in this place who has not yet received the overwhelming, superabundant grace that you offer in Christ, because of their own disbelief and their own stubbornness and our own unwillingness to, to come under that flood, that torrential flood of mercy, God, I pray that no one would leave this place tonight without looking for someone to pray with. Gracious and mighty and everlasting God, make us fully aware, fully awake to the reality that we are sojourners, pilgrims, strangers in this world. Let our heart's affection be upon the cross only. Let our addictions be in sharing your love and in following after the Lord of mercy, the King of kings. Jesus the Christ. God, tonight we praise you and I thank you in his most precious and holy name. Amen. Amen.